But I want to just, again, thank everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, there'll be a few other folks, I'm sure, that'll be joining little by little. Uh, I'm Nancy Howell, one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And we have a series of announcements from uh, some of our board members. And you'll be hearing from me a little bit more than normal because a couple of folks couldn't make it this evening. So I will be speaking on their behalf. But again, thank you so much. And my slides, of course, are being slow. There we go. So I introduced myself. One more. Again, apologies for my slow computer. There are also some pop-ups on your screen. Uh, someone's mentioned in the chat, I see them too. I don't know if it's possible to close those or move those behind uh, I don't off. see those. Um, it's like there's a long bar along the top and then a square oh, on the right corner. Yeah, I don't know if I can hide that. You just made a bigger I turn that off. There we go. Yeah, that bar is going to be up there. Unfortunately. Maybe if you shut down the presentation and restart it up again. Oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> it will take forever to come back up. Oops, come on. There we go. All righty. Yay. I'm kind of we're walking through things here. Um, I welcomed everyone, and I want to go over a few other things. Our, our volunteer needs, our spring bird walk series, uh, of course, becoming a member, and then signing up for the Western Cuyahoga Audubon e-newsletter. All righty. So as far as our volunteer needs, we have been asked to participate in a couple of Earth Day events. Uh, one of them is Earth Day with Sustainable Berea, and it's being held at Co Lake Park in Berea, which is near the Berea Library. Uh, it is on Saturday, April 22nd from 10 in the morning to 1 o'clock or until the event ends. There may It may extend just a little longer. So it's really not a whole day event. It's just a nice uh, uh, little section of day of the day. Uh, there'll be a cleanup at Co Lake, but then there'll be some display tables and sustainable Berea uh, and Baldwin Wallace University are two of the sponsors and they'll be having things going on uh, throughout the week. But that day, that Saturday is their Earth Day celebration. So we need volunteers for that day. And you can see uh, you simply reach uh, me at info at wcaudubon.org. Uh, another one of our uh, events is the Parma Heights Earth Day event, and that's being held at Greenbrier Commons in Parma Heights on the 29th of, of uh, April. And that's, uh, again, only in the afternoon from 1 to 4. So again, they're not taking the entire day. It's just taking a couple of hours. Of course, we need to set up and tear down. So there'll be a little bit of time before and afterward, but we'd love some of your help. Um, we would like to do bird walks uh, at, on both of those events. And we have requested uh, some of our bird walk leaders to, uh, to be able to help us. Um, and so please come and join us for either those events or come, please help us and volunteer just a couple of hours. Very easy, very fun. Uh, we like working and talking with the public. Sorry, keep, keep things jumping around. Come on. Nancy. 
All right, as you can see, I am reconnecting. Uh, I must have a very poor internet connection. Back to my slideshow. Well, while this slide is up, I did want to mention our spring bird walk series. And uh, it's in our 90th year of the spring bird walk series, and they take place in a variety of places in Cuyahoga, Lake Geauga, and Lorraine counties. The walks are on the last three Sundays of April, which you can see are the 16th, 23rd, and 30th, and the first three Sundays of May, which is the 7th. 14th and 21st. And they start at 7.30. Uh, there are a couple of places where there might be a slightly later start. Uh, one of the, uh, the walks in uh, Lorraine County is going to start at 8.30 because the park doesn't open until then. And the uh, one of the Medina parks, the River Sticks Park, uh, they have their walks on the Saturdays. Uh, before um, our Sundays. So, but the ones that we tend to run are the Lake Isaac, which is the Southern terminus of the Lake to Lake Trail in Big Creek Reservation, uh, the Rocky River Nature Center in Rocky River Reservation and Station Road Trailhead in the Brecksville Reservation and Cuyahoga Valley. So we hope that you can join us. Um, we have, all, there's a, again, there's a lot more walks going on in a variety of, of counties. So you may choose to do all six in one place, or you might choose to do a different one every week. And of course, we'd like you to stay informed. You can sign up for our e-newsletter, which comes out once a, a week mm -hmm. uh, through MailChimp. And it simply is reminders about events and programs, updates, um, again, requests for volunteers, things like that. So again, once a week is not too bad, uh, but if you feel like you're getting a little too much information, you can unsubscribe at any time. So then at that, think about becoming a member of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. Next, our board member, Michelle Brocious, will chat about our bird walks as well as social media. Michelle. All right, yes, thank you, Nancy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as Nancy said, I'm going to cover our upcoming bird walks, uh, Biggest Day with David Lindo event, and invite you to connect with us on social media. Next slide, please. I'm waiting for it to move. There, you go. Oops, there we go. All right. So please join us the second Saturday of every month for our second Saturday bird walk. The next one is this Saturday, March 11th at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center. We meet between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the nature center trails. Bill Dunninger, Dave Grasskemper, Ken Gober, and Al Rand are our leaders for the walk. Last year in March, there were several highlights, including our resident barred owl, three pileated woodpecker, our first of the year eastern phoebe, and a fox sparrow that was at the Nature Center feeding station for which we had great, unobstructed, extremely close views. Next slide, please. All right, this past second Saturday was held on February 11th, and here is Bill Dininger's report. He says, the February 2023 second Saturday of the month bird walk was a joint walk with Kirtland Bird Club. There were 31 observers on the walk. We tallied 28 species as a group. The weather started at 29 degrees and ended at 34 degrees and was sunny the entire walk. We saw the usual suspects. A red-tailed hawk appears to be nesting at the same location as last year, just outside the nature center. We had our first northern flicker and three red-winged blackbirds made an appearance. There was a lot of woodpecker activity throughout the entire walk. We estimated that 12 red-bellied woodpeckers were in several locations, including one pair working on a nesting hole. 
And downy woodpeckers were in many locations. White-breasted nuthatches were also in many locations. One interesting observation was the brown creeper. The brown creeper was at the feeding station on the ground, hanging upside down on the feeders and approached within five feet of the window. All right, next slide, please. All right, so please join us the fourth Saturday of every month for our Tremont Towpath Urban Bird Walk. The next one is on March 25th at 9 a.m., uh, meeting at the Towpath Public Parking Lot on Abbey Avenue, just west of West 13th Street and east of the I-90 Interbelt Bridge. Nancy Howell and Al Rand are our leaders for the walk, and they will guide you north through the Scranton Flats area of the Towpath. Last month, the group was treated to a good look at a female hooded merganser. Other notable species from that walk include ruddy duck, American coot, redhead, lesser scout, and Cooper's hawk. It seems there's a lot of bird activity in Tremont, so please join us this month. All right, next slide. All right, so Furry Meadows is a 298-acre park that offers trails through prairie, wet sedge meadow, and woodland habitats. I birded this location last April with my uncle and experienced birder, Robert Opper, and was amazed at the variety of species we found. Last year, we had 36 species, including the Savannah Sparrow, Eastern Meadowlark, Eastern Bluebird, Tree Swallow, Brown Thrasher, Killdeer, Virginia Rail, Wilson Snipe, and Sora. Please join us on April 22nd at 8 a.m. for this joint bird walk with Western Kyle Audubon and Kirtland Bird Club. Next slide. All right, David Lindo is coming back, so please mark your calendar for May 6th. Uh, the day will consist of a morning joint bird walk with Western Reserve Land Conservancy at Brighton Park. Space is limited. Uh, we will have an opportunity to do lunch with David at Mark and Garden Brewery. That is also limited registration. Uh, an afternoon bird walk at Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve that is open to all. And then a group dinner with David at Sibling Revelry Brewing that is limited registration only. Uh, after spending the day with us, David will travel west where he will be a keynote speaker and lead a bird walk at the biggest week in American Birding Festival. And that's super exciting and it will be so great to see our friend again. Uh, and after I'm done with my announcements, I'll go ahead and put the registration link in the chat. If anyone is interested, you can get yourself on those, those registrations. All right, next slide, please. All right, finally, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Many of our virtual programs are recorded like this speaker series meeting and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe. I believe that's it for me. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Michelle. Really appreciate it. And I hope uh, you appreciated those lovely photographs, that, that fox sparrow. Boom. Wow, what a photo. All right, I'm going to be standing in for Drina Nemes, who is our book discussion series chair and, a, of course, a Western Cuyahoga Audubon member. Um, we have our book discussions, uh, three books uh, during the year. And the themes this past year, 22-23 were climate change, adaptation, the species studies of the, um, of the pigeon, that one was fun by Rosemary, the book by Rosemary Mosco, and the upcoming session, come on, change, 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 is A World on the Wing, The Global Odyssey of Migratory Birds by Scott Widensall. And that is on Tuesday, April 18th at seven o'clock. Um, and we will send out a Zoom link. It is our last book discussion of the 22-23 year. And of course we will start up again uh, in the fall and have three more books, um, lots of different choices. And if you have a suggestion uh, as to what a book that you may want to share or have others read, um, we'd love to have that information. So um, with, with uh, Mr. Widensall's book, of course, it's all about the miracles of bird migration, the science, the technology. You do not have to purchase the book. You can pick it up at one of the libraries and read it uh, for the book discussion. If you 
just want to join the discussion or hear about the book uh, and maybe then pick it up later, that's a possibility too. So you do not have to have the book read. You maybe you're in the middle of it. Maybe you're saying, gee, I wonder if it's a good book. So the discussion is really open to anyone and we'd love to have you join us. Now, in addition to uh, the book discussion that we're having, Black River Audubon is, has invited uh, Scott Widensall to their Jack Smith Outstanding Speaker Program, which is on Saturday, March 25th from 3 to 5 p.m. And it is at their Lorraine County Metro Parks, the Carlisle Visitor Center, which is on Diagonal Road in LaGrange. Uh, you do have to register through Black River Audubon uh, website. Uh, it is $10 for, I believe, non-members. And the uh, site is listed right there. Um, it's just simply www.blackriveraudubon.org. Outstanding speaker, outstanding dash speaker. So you can just go to the uh, Black River Audubon website and then look for that outstanding speaker. Uh, link. There you go. Now, in addition, uh, we talked about David Lindo and we talked about Scott Widensall. Well, David uh, did have a discussion with uh, Scott um, uh, in April of 2021. And you can look at that blog uh, on the urbanbirdersworld.com live webinars. Uh, it is David's uh, presentation in the series called In Conservation With. There are several ses sessions each month yeah. and you can join, to the, join those and listen to those, but you can go back to that webinar with uh, Scott Leidensall and David Lindo, again, which was on uh, in April of 2021. All righty, Mary Ann, uh, who is our Climate Watch Coordinator for Northeast Ohio. Hi, Mary Ann. Hi, everybody. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, the, the, the winter session was January 15th through February 15th. And we did a really nice job. We covered probably 19 of the squares that are on the um, Audubon GIS tool. And in north in northeastern Ohio, we covered everything from the lake down to Rittman and all the way to the west, but like even parts parts of Columbiana County. Um, so we we did a, a nice nice representation. Um, next next slide, please. Uh, the the upcoming session will will be the spring and summer session, which is runs from May fifteenth through June fifteenth. So we're hoping that if you uh, if you volunteered before, that you will volunteer again, cover maybe the same squares, and and if you want to still you know volunteer and pick up a new square, give me a call. My phone number and my email are here on this uh, slide. Um, you can also watch the video that of how to do this this the the climate watch survey that at that link that's at the that very top link at the top here. Uh, what we're going to do is that last time we had a, a big day where everybody went out, or at least most of the people went out on one big day and did the climate watch. Um, this for the summertime session we're going to we've selected Saturday June the third. So. Um, we're hoping that you all can 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 join us on June the third and get your surveys done and participate. And we appreciate that. Um, any well, next slide. Anything else here, or is that my last I slide? That, I think that I think that is the last slide. And you know, this is open to people who have done the climate watch in the winter, but we can have more people, right, Marianne? Absolutely, absolutely, we can do that. Because maybe not everybody will, will want to do it again this summertime, or maybe they're busy being on vacation. So it'd be great to have extra volunteers or we even have more squares coming on. Um, there's a 
We've got the, the Black River chapter is gonna start picking up the Lorraine County. So there's some opportunities there too. So let us know if you wanna volunteer. Great, thank you so much, Marianne, appreciate it. Uh, Amanda Sabrowski, our coffee coordinator, again, could not be here this evening. So again, I will stand in for her. And uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon on our website sells birds and beans coffee. It is the only uh, you, you know, brand uh, that is 100% Smithsonian certified bird friendly. It is shade grown, organic and fair trade. Uh, so it really does ensure that the forests in Central and South America are not clear cut. So it leaves the, the native vegetation, the shade, uh, shaded areas, uh, uh, and the coffee is grown beneath those, the native vegetation. And so the birds that winter in Central and South America, we call them our birds, but of course they spend most of their time down there. Um, they have intact forests so that they can uh, you know, do, do their non-breeding season in those areas and then make their way back to uh, our lovely areas in the spring and summer. Uh, please do order from our homepage for the coffee club. Now the next order is going in on April 10th. So please stock up now so you'll get that, you can have that hot coffee and enjoy it during our spring birding and the bird walks. The next order won't go in until July. So really, this is the time to stock up and order. Uh, April 10th uh, will be the last day Then we will send that order in on April 11th and you will have your coffee within a week. It is freshly ground and shipped to us. So please do look at our website uh, for the bird friendly coffee. I do want to mention that in April, we have a wonderful speaker program, uh, Kathy Mock, who touts herself as a birder, gar gardener, and birding volunteer, is going to speak on the magic of merlins. Uh, if you're not familiar with merlins, not the, not the magician, but a small falcon that has now begun taking up residence in many, many parts of Ohio, and so I am excited to have uh, Kathy Ma speak on the observations and things she has learned from observing the Merlins uh, around the Akron area. So join us on Tuesday, April 4th. Again, we have our meeting, our announcement at 7.30, and then the program will begin at eight o'clock. But this evening, we are having our, our, uh, one of our friends, Judy Semrock, who's a naturalist, educator, and photographer. Her program, The Many Faces of Conservation. Come on, computer. It'll be coming. Now, Judy has spoken with us before, and uh, she is a, a wonderful naturalist. She is the founder of Chrysalis in Time, the first Ohio chapter of North American Butterfly Association. She also serves on the board of the Ohio Bluebird Society and Ohio Ornithological Society, the Conservation Committee. She has co-authored two natural history guides, Dragonflies and Damselflies of Northeast Ohio and Goldenrods of Northeast Ohio, a field guide to identification and natural history. As a former petroleum geologist and science teacher, Judy loves to learn about and share her passion for the natural world through hikes, interpretive programs, and photography. Learn more about Judy's latest adventures and offerings through her new company, Nature Spark. So, with that, I am going to stop sharing and Judy will bring, bring her slides up for the evening. Well, thank you, Nancy. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak. 
And hopefully this will all go as planned. Oops. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone this evening. Uh, I put together this program because I felt that if people would see oh, things in nature up close, that they would have a better appreciation of the connectivity and then also maybe do a little bit more in trying to help uh, you know, help things along and what can you and others do in your own backyards or in the ways that you volunteer that can help uh, with these creatures. So I'm going to start with, uh, I put up some close-ups here. So we've got our great horned owl, um, our red bat. And if you look kind of carefully at it, you can see the ears, ears, the nose. Obviously, the eyes are a little bit closed. Uh, we don't normally get to see the bats up close. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful little animal, our bald eagle. Uh, this is the face of a morning cloak butterfly. So you can see this little brown area here in the front. That's its tongue or its little proboscis, let's say, that's rolled up and coiled up against its face. Uh, and then we'll, it will extend it as it flies and approaches its nectar source. Then we have a close-up of the face of a spice bush swallowtail caterpillar when it's getting ready to make its chrysalis. And then that's the close-up face of an amber wing spread wing uh, damselfly. So down here you can see the little jaws. It's got this great little crew cut haircut here between the eyes and all damselflies have their eyes separated they do not touch like we have in dragon in some of our species of dragonflies here's our american toad picture wing fly that looks like it's got a little gas mask on for its face and you can see these tiny little hairs at the end of its uh, the end of its face, which it uses to detect things as it moves across leaves and other parts of the vegetation. Uh, our American kestrel, our little white-footed mouse, and a red fox with some prey in the winter time. And again, all of these things, if we Normally, for example, that picture wing fly, you don't get to see it up close. You don't see the detail in the face and in the wings. And it's very important that we sort of pay attention to why these things have the adaptations that they do because of either where they live as far as habitat or how they hunt or how they feed. And so it's important to note that while we're looking at all these great creatures, it's a lot of their features that make them important and the more that we can learn about them the more that we can help to conserve them. So we have also those uh, species that I sort of labeled those without eyes so I put them in the in the plant category so there's our Turks cap lily our trailing arbutus which is a very early spring wildflower and um, it's got these really cute little pale pink and white flowers that are very, very fragrant in the early spring. Our wild lupin, our trolleus or globe flower, and our rose pagonia orchid. So again, some of these are in very specific type of habitats. So while we are out there hopefully protecting these habitats, some of them are in more of wetland type areas. And of course, as we fill in wetlands or we change the hydrology of wetlands, we are greatly impacting uh, those species. And then, so what do these things need? So they need habitat variety because again, where they live is very, very important. And of course, many of our rarities are found because they live in rare habitats. And if we don't protect those rare habitats, we're not gonna have the rare species that call them home. So we have woodland swamps, uh, rock ledges. Uh, the upper right is showing one of our uh, channel ponds. 
So the Chagrin River, for example, is off here, but these channel ponds form as the river raises in height during flooding season. And then as it recedes, it leaves these little ponds, which end up being great little um, natural nurseries for a lot of our amphibians. Uh, wetlands, swamps, marshes, meadows, uh, big expanses of open areas, which we tend to lose because when we see those and they're dry, people tend to develop them. And then our streams, woodland streams, headwater streams, things like that. All of these are very, very important to a variety of species. So what do they need? Well, they need food for themselves. So here's our green heron with the fish, one of our robber fly species with a powder dancer, um, our water snake with, with a catfish that has to actually swim to the shore in order to feed on it, our monarch butterfly on our orange butterfly weed, which includes a couple of little uh, caterpillars in here. You see one that's in a pretty far along instar here. We've got a little grasshopper here. We've got another little tiny cater, uh, monarch caterpillar there. We have our, um, our sundew, which again is in specific type of habitats. And if you'll notice, it has actually closed over uh, a damselfly that got fooled by the little, uh, if you see these little arms, on the plant, they've got little, um, they look like droplets at the ends of the little stalks. And that's what attracts some of the insects to go hunting because they think it's a fluid that they can either feed upon or an insect might already have been captured inside of there. So some of the smaller predatory insects will go in there to investigate and they them, themselves get caught. And there's our ruby-throated hummingbird checking out uh, common milkweed. They also need food for their young. So there's our bobolink gathering caterpillars to feed to the young. This is an imperial moth caterpillar, which is feeding basically one needle at a time off of a white pine tree. Common yellow throat, again, we all know, I know I'm preaching to the audience here or preaching to the choir here that we all know how important the caterpillar um, food is to our bird species, especially when they're feeding young. So th it's, it's a huge thing to have a lot of variety of plant species, both trees, shrubs, and uh, herbaceous plants to help attract the butterflies and moths to lay their eggs so that we have a good uh, collection of caterpillars for the birds to feed. Here's our black swallowtail caterpillar feeding on Queen Anne's lace. Uh, barn swallow bringing Actually, if you were able to see the front of that, she's the adult is bringing a eastern amber wing to a dragonfly to the young. And then again, native bees that are going around all the flowers collecting pollen to bring back to you know their, their young or their collection of where they have their nesting areas. So again, all of this is extremely important. They also need very, uh, in some cases, very specific uh, nest sites. And what's important, here's, here's one of our four-toed salamanders, which is a state-listed species because of where it lives. Typically, it will lay its eggs, as you can see behind here. In there, each of those eggs are sort of encapsulated in a, um, in a mass that helps to keep them moist. Uh, sometimes those eggs are laid under the moss that's at the base of, of um, button bush shrubs in wetland areas. Sometimes they are a button push swamp. Sometimes they're in a bog or fen type setting. But again, because this is a more rare species, it is due to the fact that where the habitat that they need is more of a rare habitat. Here's our hairy neck tiger beetle, which is also one of our rarities. And again, they make these little uh, burrow sites in the sand, which typically are along the Lake Erie shorelines. And you can see how hairy the legs are. But again, you see the jaws here in the front. 
And they're a great little predator as they move across the sand, picking up all kinds of little smaller insect uh, species that are also using the sand. But they're at a very high risk because we have a lot of um, people that use ATVs and things like that along our you know, Lake Erie beaches or even some of our uh, areas that are protected, they get some extra movement in there that is not conducive to their nesting and their little hangouts as, as an insect, as a tiger beetle insect. And then our prothonotary warblers looking for nesting cavities in, you know, in the trees along, typically along streams, uh, quiet little river settings, things like that. And of course, they've really been enhanced and helped by the nesting boxes that have been put up in a number of areas. Uh, we also have um, just some things of showing where and how the adults take care of their young. So this is one of our centipedes. That's the mom, and as she lays her eggs, then she actually wraps her body around them and then uses her pairs of legs to sort of hold them in place. Typically, you would find this, say, under a rotting log or something in the woodlands that's in the leaf litter. So our leaf litter and our temperature of our leaf litter is extremely important. So when you talk about climate change or you talk about losing trees, for example, to beech trees to the uh, various diseases, beech leaf disease, or losing the ashes to the emerald ash borer, which then in turn opens up the canopy, which then in turn lets a lot of sunlight down onto the forest floor. These are the types of creatures that can be impacted by those types of things. Um, here's our screech owls, again, using a cavity to uh, both you know, hang out in, roost in, and nest in. There's our American mink, which likes to make its little den sites in and around the roots of trees that are along you know, stream beds. And as erosion either hollows out areas in there or as the water level raises and lower during flooded areas, the minks may need to move on as they frequently do and continue to make sites where the nesting will work because it won't totally be underwater. Here's our little red-winged blackbird nestlings in the nest that you typically see them build uh, on the edges of ponds or other waterways where there might be cattails or a variety of reed type grasses, things like that. But again, by taking the nests and actually building them out even into the water, which helps them in a, in a predatory standpoint to try to keep the nestlings away from things that would feed upon them. And it's a little harder to feed upon them when they're out over the water. And then of course, ants in their nests where they carry their eggs and do a lot of really careful care to them. So again, as, as these species are caring for their young and caring for their eggs, uh, the habitat that they use is incredibly important. And I put this little sequence in here uh, several years ago. I had uh, discovered a sandhill crane pair that were making a nest in an area where we had not noticed them in the past. And I would sort of hide in the woods and stay far enough away. But it was so interesting to watch them as I would make uh, multiple trips just to check on them. You can see the eggs in the nest in the upper right hand corner. Uh, most of the time, if a plane would go over or any type of noise was going on, uh, whether the female or the male was on the nest, they would put their heads down low so that obviously their heads weren't sticking up and making them more easily seen. But you can see that both of them are in the photo on the lower right. So you can see the female's likely on the nest and the male's sort of guarding or helping her out just in just in spirit. Uh, the eggs never did hatch, but it was likely because this may have been a new pair or a young pair. So uh, I've not been able to go back to that site to check to see if they were able to come back and nest and have a successful nesting. But 
uh, it's it's always great to see sandhills nesting in you know northeast Ohio. And then other things that they need is they need nesting materials. So here's our beaver gnawings, which we know how effective they can be as as engineers. There's our swallow that's picking up mud that will continually bring that back and forth to the nest in building the nest and then adding each little mouthful of mud. And you can see how, uh, if you ever have watched the swallows, barn swallows in particular, um, going to a, a pile of mud or an area of mud and they will roll the mud around in their bills before they actually take off to bring it back. So they always look like they are little circles or little globes of mud. And then when you look closely at a nest, which I'll have a picture of later, you can actually see those little blobs or those little globes of mud uh, as an individual um, globe uh, in the nest. So you can tell that you can almost count the number of trips that were made by the number of little uh, globes of mud that were part of it, part of their journey. Here's our little blue winged warbler that was working very hard to make a nest at a location. And after the nest was made there, we had a torrential downpour and we went back to take a look at the nest. And of course the flooding actually took out the shrub that the um, warbler was making the nest in so it did not survive. Uh, hopefully it was early enough in this nesting season that it was able to go to another location and then and make a new nest. And of course, we don't want to ever underestimate the amount of bird species that use grapevines in their nesting. So I think the the statistic now is that for our forest nesting birds, it's something like 67 or 68 percent, and it's probably even higher now as we do more research, that are using the little peelings off of the grapevines to then form the framework of their nest to which then they will add finer grasses and all kinds of other material where the eggs will be or where the young will be. But we always notice that when we do Christmas bird counts and we're in areas where, for example, someone has gone in and removed grapevines or uh, a lot of people tell me when I go onto their properties that the forestry folks tell them to remove the grapevines if they want a better yield on their trees when they go to remove their trees or log their trees. But we also notice that when we go into these areas where there's few or no grapevines that we have a lot fewer bird species uh, during the winter months and especially during the uh, Christmas bird counts. The other things that they need are clean water because just like us, they need clean water. Um, head, headwater streams, ponds, uh, bogs, fens, and all types of clean water is, is an essential part of any of these creatures, not just for drinking, but also for uh, where they live. Again, some of our rare odonates or dragonflies and damselflies really can only live in some of these areas that have certain pH or certain uh, depth to the water. Uh, same thing with areas around the ponds. If if people go in and, and mow and then take their grass clippings and dump them into the pond behind their house and it's got any kind of a chemical in it, then of course that ends up in the water, which again affects all the other creatures that are using that water for whatever reason within their life cycle or with their young or anything else. So it's it's very important that remembering the connectivity of everything that we try to keep as much of the needs such as the water, the building materials, the habitats as, as much intact as we can. And unfortunately, we don't see a lot of that happening. So what are we giving them? Well, we're giving them a lot of invasive and non-native species. So we've got our vinca or periwinkle on the left, our Asian bittersweet in this uh, bittersweet vine in the central center slide and then or center picture and then the garlic mustard which we know is can be a, a real problem for our West Virginia white butterfly which is a globally imperiled species and we are lucky enough to have still locations in Northeast Ohio where that butterfly 
uh, is, is actually being able to sustain itself. Uh, most of the other states uh, on the East Coast, New Jersey and some of the other ones, they, the butterfly is now extirpated from those states. But it's, it's a problem if we don't try to keep our garlic mustard at bay because again, being, being a butterfly that lands on the garlic mustard and knows that it's in the cardamony family, which it's a mustard, um, they really don't need garlic mustard as a plant for their larva to survive upon. But unfortunately, the female can't distinguish the fact that the garlic mustard is not able to be fed upon by her larva and lays her eggs on them anyway. So the more that is pulled, the better it is, in fact, for West Virginia white butterflies, but for other species as well, including plant species that try to live around garlic mustard because in it's allelopathic in a, the sense that it can add chemicals to the soil to keep other plants from growing around it. And of course, you know, keeping it um, not having competition. So when you take a look at areas that are pretty much infected, let's say, with some of these invasive species, the photo on the left is a area where vinca was planted at an old farmhouse and then it took over you know, 30 to 40 acres of a woodland. And as you can see, there's nothing really much growing up through the vinca other than the trees. And then the uh, Asian bittersweet, that's a vine that we call a constricting vine because as it grows and wraps around the tree, it's not like, for example, a grapevine just uses the trees to grow upward so that they can reach sunlight. Uh, the bittersweet vine wraps and continues to wrap around the trees or around whatever it's growing upon. And as the tree tries to grow and the vine tries to grow, it's it's like getting uh, crushed or constricted, sort of like a snake would do. And then there's our West Virginia white butterfly in the upper right. The female's got her abdomen curled onto the plant and is laying an egg. And of course, if it's on garlic mustard, then when that egg hatches and the larva starts to eat, uh, it does not make it through to the next instar. So it's basically a sink for that species. And then at the bottom, you see an area that uh, used to be a really wonderful wetland, series of wetlands. And as uh, work was being done in the area, it's very likely that the heavy equipment brought the Phragmites in as seeds. And once it got established, you're looking at probably about 150 acres in that view that was once a, an open wetland area that is now pretty much totally covered with the garlic mustard, except for some sections, I'm sorry, not garlic mustard with the Phragmites, except for the open sections, which is typically because the water is deeper and the Phragmites can't survive in that certain depth of water. We also have other uh, invasive species and non-native species that are insects that we have brought, we as humans, have brought into the to the mix. So we have our earthworms in the upper left. We have our um, larva from our Asian lady beetle. So the larva is in the upper right and the Asian lady beetle adult is in the lower right. And then we have our praying mantises. Now, unfortunately for Northeast Ohio, most all of the praying mantises that you see are either the European mantis or the Chinese mantis. And those are both non-native and very invasive uh, because then they end up, because they're so much larger than our native mantis species, which is called the Carolina mantis, which we typically find more in the southern part of the state. It's been many, many years since I've seen a Carolina mantis even uh, say north of the Columbus area. Most of the ones that I see are south of the Columbus area. But again, you can see in that picture that that is a, is a mantis that was mating and the male was on her back. And when they were done mating, she grabbed the male from behind her and then proceeded to feed upon him. So she she's eating a leg that she, of the mantis that you see uh, within her very strong jaws. 
but the mantises are a hide and watch type of predator. So many times they're hiding in plants that have flowers. So the flowers attract butterflies and bees and other beneficial insects. And even during the evening when the dragonflies go to sleep, they will also hide in these taller areas where there's flowering plants. And in the morning when they're trying to uh, take off and their wings are still wet from dew, the praying mantises detect the motion and go over and feed upon them. So again, we've brought these species in and mainly because of gardening um, and obviously the worms with um, a lot of our fishing, but people would order praying mantis egg cases to take care of the aphids on their rose bushes. Uh, you could also get and when you would order them, you would always get the egg cases of either the European or the Chinese mantids. Um, same thing with the ladybugs, again, because they both eat uh, aphids as their larval stage, which is the black and orange at the top, or as their adult stage, gardeners would order them or people would order them to take care of what they considered pests in their garden. And now they're pretty much everywhere. And the adult Asian lady beetle is the one that comes into your house like in the fall or if it lands on you it can give you a little bit of a pinch much larger than our native lady beetles again so here's here's kind of the effects of what you see uh, this upper picture is an area that is uh, highly infested with our earthworms or with the earthworms. And again, if you wanna learn more about the earthworms, it's quite the uh, education that you can get. Uh, Wisconsin had a great, or still does have a great website dealing with the earthworms and talking about the various species that occur within certain uh, areas of our soil. So the up, upper couple of inches have a certain species that favors that. And then as you get deeper into the soil, you have other species of our non-native earthworms. And basically what happens is while the deer might be eating the parts of the plants that are above the soil, the, the non-native earthworms are actually feeding on the leaf litter. And then when they make their casts or what we call considered like worm poop, they add the chemical from their body in it, which keeps other plants from germinating. It also helps to add, adding that chemical to the soil not only keeps other plants from germinating, but it also uh, plays havoc with the soil insects. So back in the day, I remember when I was in grade school, uh, at the end of the year, they would give you a little styrofoam cup and it had four or five earthworms in it and you were supposed to take them home and put them in your garden so that it would help with the, uh, oh, the way that the water movement could move through their little tunnels that they would make and things like that. But little did we know that we were putting in non-native earthworms. So that's kind of what you see. And even though they move slowly, you can see behind it where there's more vegetation on the forest floor, but in the foreground, there's less vegetation and you can actually dig into the soil and, and up come all the worms. So you know that you've got an infestation. There's our praying mantis down below, it's caught a butterfly. And then here's two other non-native um, lady beetle species that they're basically um, working very hard to perform more than one duty at a time. They're actually eating the aphids that's in front of the female, which is on the bottom and while the male is mating with her. So they're, they're sort of um, working hard to take care of every part that they need to go through. But as you can see, again, being a species that can eat the aphids and which is why they were brought in, they also are uh, very much a problem with our native lady beetles. We also give them what, what I've termed species overruns. So you all as birders and bird enthusiasts know how uh, problematic raccoons can be in a number of ways, uh, not only eating bird eggs out of nests and things like that, but they cause a lot of other problems that we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, our turtle eggs, huge, huge problem. We are 
rapidly losing uh, a lot of our turtle young because it's easy enough to find uh, adult turtles that are older, might be 10, 20, 30 years in age and more. But as you can see, when the turtles come out of the ponds or out of the waterways to lay their eggs, they come out, they use their legs to dig a nest, they deposit the eggs in the nest, and they also use their legs to put the mud sort of back over the nest. But it's very obvious that something has been digging there or deposited there and the raccoons come out at night and they walk those areas and anytime they see disturbed soil they dig it up and you can see what happens they basically break open all the eggs and and eat everything that's in there uh, some of our species like our box turtles they aren't uh, sexually mature until many years uh, down the road so it's an it's important to note that if you have a nesting season with the box turtles and they make their nest and they lay their eggs and the raccoons come and eat all of their eggs, well, now you've got no new baby box turtles for that season. And the fact that it takes them longer to become sexually mature, uh, it's just every year we're having fewer and fewer uh, young or baby turtles that actually make it through the egg stage. And that includes snapping turtles, painted turtles, uh, a lot of our other turtle species that we know are in peril. Uh, people go out and when they know where the nests are or, or know the areas where they nest, they actually put uh, fencing, <coughs> excuse me, around them so that the raccoons can't predate them while they're still in the egg stage. They also cause excuse me, a great deal of problems with our freshwater mussel population. Um, unfortunately, we know that the raccoons can walk along the edge of any of the waterways. They swim fine as their feet touch a mussel underwater. They grab it, pull it up, open it, <laughs> excuse me, and eat the soft body of the mussel inside of the shell. The purple shell or the, the shell with the inside that looks sort of a purple, that's called the ladyfinger mussel. And then the mussel to the right is one of the rainbow mussels. But again, most of or many of our mussels are on our state list. <coughs> uh, because of the raccoon predation. I'm just, <laughs> excuse me, I'm gonna grab some water here real quick, sorry. Hmm. Sorry about that. So that's a huge problem with our raccoons. And in fact, because we don't have much of a predation factor with raccoons, they're pretty much at liberty to hunt and wreak havoc on a lot of species because there are so many of them. And of course we have our white-tailed deer, which we all know, despite the fact that they're cute as a Bambi, um, not only do they do a lot of eating of things that we don't necessarily like, but when they are not hunted or people put out food for them in their yards, again, causes the problem to become even more dire. And we can see, of course, as the deer go through and munch on things, whether it's um, the trees that they can feed upon at a certain level, and we know what deer browse is. Um, we know that they also can as they come across ground nesting birds, they will eat the eggs. And that was proven through a lot of the studies that were done out in the prairie areas of the United States when they were finding that some of these prairie nesting birds weren't, you know, they, the numbers weren't increasing. And so they set up a lot of cameras and they found that as deer would walk through the prairies and come upon these ground nests that they would be feeding on the eggs before the young would ever hatch. Um, Normally, there's not a lot of things that eat 
milkweed because of the sap, the white sap that's in it. But remember that when deer are hungry, they're going to eat whatever they need to eat for whatever reason. So again, trying to keep them in check is, is always a very common problem that people have, park districts have, um, you know, land conservation people have. We also do a lot of things that we shouldn't do, habitat destruction, chemical treatments, forest fragmentation. And again, um, we use, we don't do it as much as we used to, uh, but even in areas where there's ample trash collection, we still have people that just sort of chuck their trash over the edge of a road that might sit up high where the land slopes away like you see in the upper left. Uh, we still have a lot of our areas that are being farmed that might have a spring coming up through the middle of it or a wetland in the middle of it and they will go in and um, again lay drain tile in to drain it off so that they can um, obviously get a better yield on their farming but these areas if they were left as shallow wetlands and things like that you see a variety of ducks and uh, you know, snipe, things like that, that use that. And then this photo on the right is one of, uh, one of my worst areas that I came upon and one of my best photos showing that they came into an area that was a really nice woods. It was adjacent to an interstate. So it looked as if the owner thought, well, if I clear this and put a for sale sign on it, that maybe a new business park will move in and I'll make all kinds of money. So they came in and they cleared it. And you can see where they stopped at a certain point and they put a, put a for sale sign on it and the land never sold. And six or eight or 10 years down the road, it was filled with autumn olive and Phragmites and just about any other um, invasive that can come into an area and take over fairly quickly. Uh, the land still hasn't sold and the, you know, the woods are all gone. So the habitat destruction there was pretty significant. And again, when we open up these areas, we cause other problems as well. Uh, for example, uh, we know that our scarlet tanagers, when, again, when we do the things mentioned in the previous slide, then we see loss of species, nest parasitism, and a lot of other things. So we know that our scarlet tanager likes woods, big blocks of woods, you know, 100 acres, 200 acres, 300 acres, and that's their preference areas for nesting. Unfortunately, you as all as birders will see our hooded warbler that's of course feeding a cowbird fledgling that obviously came out of the nest that uh, obviously is much bigger as a fledgling than even the warbler itself is look at the size of the open mouth compared to the you know the size of the warbler but again when you fragment a woods and you leave these openings through the middle of them then that allows species like cowbirds to come in and look for potential uh, sites to deposit their eggs. And, and again, now you've taken that next generation for this particular pair of, of hooded warblers and they don't have anything to show for it other than feeding the cowbird. And then in the lower part, we've got our spotted salamander that's got a fungal infection, likely from some uh, chemicals or something that were in the water of their area where they were either meeting up to uh, meet with a female, lay eggs. Uh, so it was possibly a vernal pool that was beside something that maybe changed and chemicals were either added to the water or uh, even in the areas where they overwinter underground that can, you know, can cause problems there as well. So we don't necessarily think about what our actions actually end up causing, but here are some examples that are, that are pretty obvious. So hang in there, all is not lost. There are some things that you know, we can do and the more that we do, uh, obviously better. 
here's our little spring peeper. He's he's hanging in there. Uh, so think about again preserving and protecting habitat diversity. So our waterways, our big expanses of open fields that might have a good variety of flowering plants, um, springs, and um, fresh water, little seeps that are coming through our woodlands. All of these areas, when we preserve these types of areas, then we help to invite and protect these little faces. So we've got our hummingbird sphinx moth, our barred owl, our six spotted tiger beetle across the top. We've got our crayfish lower left and our red spotted newt in the lower right. And again, all of these things matter. They're all connected in one way or another, obviously to the habitat, but also to the well being of the habitat uh, in general. When we preserve and protect rare habitats, such as um, a bog here on the left, uh, woodland wetlands in the middle, the upper middle, uh, another area of flooded wooded, wet, wooded wetlands in the early spring, and then again, fen or bog type habitats, then we protect the rare species. That's a beautiful bog willow on the left, our spotted turtle in the middle, upper middle, our chalk fronted corporal dragonfly, which is in the lower middle, it's state listed species, and then our pitcher plant. Um, unfortunately, people tend to think that when they see these rare plants, even if they're in a protected area, that they can go and dig them up and, you know, bring them home and put them in their flower beds, which of course they don't do well because they can't live in those in that type of a habitat. But the more that we protect the rare habitats, the more that we protect the rare species that need those habitats. When we preserve and protect farmland and meadow areas, uh, there's a big field of goldenrods. These up, uh, open farm areas that aren't necessarily planted, for example, in corn or soybeans, and they're actually allowed to grow up maybe as clover fields or things like that. And then in lower picture, you see where you've got a variety of, of heights of grasses and sedges and shrubs and things. Those are all really good. And you've got edge habitat along here. So both the pictures on the upper right and the lower middle, the edge habitat, especially for birds and insects, can be vitally important. Uh, because they can come out of the woodland areas, they can hunt over the meadow areas, they can nest in the shrub border that's at the conjunction between those two areas. So again, we tend to take open flatter areas and build upon them, a, a new business park, a new neighborhood, things like that, when in fact we really need those areas, especially for our insect population. So when we protect these open areas, um, we bring in a lot of, again, important things that we normally won't see, obviously in woodlands and things like that. So we've got our male bobolink, our meadow vole in the middle, our eastern meadowlark, meadowlark on the upper right. And then we know our sandhill cranes will come along, especially with their little colts, if they're nesting nearby. and as long as the farmers don't, you know, cut their corn stalks down to the very nub of the dirt, uh, those areas can be, you know, areas where the cranes can come in and look for invertebrates in the soil and things like that. So it, it can make a big difference how closely cropped these farm fields are. And there's our cloudless sulfur in the lower middle, which is a big yellow butterfly that looks much bigger than our uh, orange sulfurs or our yellow sulfurs. And then the dick sisal on the right. Again, these species like these open areas, like these uh, various heights of plants that are in there so that they can not only nest, but search for insects as well. So again, protecting these habitats, protect some of these faces. So again, what can we do to help? Um, 
Maybe you want to become one of the human faces of conservation. Here we have a shot of great spangled fritillaries. And it just happened to be a shot that turned out, these are one of those shots that you look at it later and think, oh my goodness, how, how this worked out when that butterfly wasn't even in the picture as I was photographing the one that you see that's feeding on the plant. Uh, so here's some things you can do to help. And again, Using native species whenever possible, avoid adding non-native or invasive species to your garden plantings because frequently they get out of the garden scenario and they move on to other areas where they are not kept in check and really can do a lot of damage. Choose true or classic plant varieties over cultivars. Use plants that will be useful both as adult and larval food sources to attract more pollinators especially our native bees, butterflies, moths, because again, remember those produce the caterpillars which are really helpful to the birds. Uh, avoid the use of pesticides and herbicides in and around your property. Provide shallow water sources and mud to attract birds and insects and mammal visitors. And then again, we, we talk about this all the time, but it doesn't seem like it's getting any better, but keep the pet cats from roaming freely and try to remove any of the feral cats that might be hanging around. But just to look at some of the photos here, we've got our buckeye butterfly chrysalis here in the upper left, uh, bumblebee, the caterpillars in the middle, those are all morning cloak caterpillars. So when the female lays her eggs, she'll lay them in a, in a big cluster. And so there's sort of the thought that if there's a lot of them, even though the birds can, can find them and eat them, they never really do enough damage to sort of defoliate an entire tree. But as they get older and then they start to split up, then they have a better chance of surviving. Here's our barn swallows in the nest. You can see, as I was mentioning before, each of these little globes of mud. So you could, you could actually sit there and count all those little globes just in the front of the nest to, re, to think about how many trips just the mud took to construct that nest. And then we have pearl crescents in the lower right, and they are doing what we call puddling. Butterflies will find wet soil or uh, carcasses of animals, a scat of animals, and they will descend upon those areas. And those are always the males that are doing it because they are picking up minerals and chemicals within either the, the dead animal or the frass or the bird poop or whatever, and putting it in the sperm packet that they pass on to the females. So whenever you see butterflies puddling, that's what they're doing. And remember, those are all males. Plant species that will provide nesting or web construction sites for spiders. I know probably nobody's ever told you to plant for spiders. And the only reason that I'm mentioning in this is because the silk from the webs are used by a variety of birds and other animals uh, in their nesting. Um, so for example, we've got our little tree frog up there that hides under the spider web which makes them a little hard, harder to be predated upon, but yet when something crosses in front of them, they can jump right out and stick their tongue out and feed upon whatever that little creature is. We've got our hummingbird that's make, in the midst of making the nest. And again, by attaching, using spider webs to attach the materials that she's building her nest with, including the lichens, you can see that there. Down in the lower left, you see the yellow warbler that's working on her nest. And again, bringing not only grass fibers and, and other um, soft things to the nest as well, they do pull the spider webs out into the nesting fibers and connect them all together because they do happen to know which of those little strands on the spider webs are the sticky strands which helps them to keep their materials together. This is an orchard orb weaver in the lower middle, which is one of the spiders that makes the type of web that the, that the birds can use the uh, webbing for their nests. 
And then we've got our blue gray gnat catcher on the right on the nest. You can see the, the lichens that were used, but then you can also see the fibers of the spider webs that were used to help hold it all together. Also, um, think about, again, as we mentioned, about how important the grapevines can be. So this is showing grapevines across the, the board here. You've got, not only do you have the grapevines, but you have the fruit. And even in winter, not all of the fruit is eaten throughout the season. So that also helps to bring the birds into a grapevine area to search for fruits that are dried, but still very edible. Uh, here's a whole collection of, of grapevines that are growing together. And then, Keep in mind about how many birds will use the ability to hide in the grapevines uh, because they either grow close together or even in the winter, it looks like a network that allows for the owls to hide. So in the middle picture, you should be able to see two great horned owls. And on the right, you should be able to see two owls there. I'll give you a second to look at that to see if you can find the owls. But there they are. So the two great horned owls are in the middle. And then on the right, you see two long-eared owls that are hiding in the grapevines during the day, uh, roosting to try to stay out of the, the way of crows or blue jays or chickadees or titmice finding them and then trying to mob them. So they can be an important area for hiding as well. Winterberry, very important food source for in the winter, late fall. Uh, and again, it's not always because uh, the, the fruit is actually mature. So some people will ask me, why does my winterberry still have fruit on it? Um, and it might be December or it might be January. And a lot of it has to do with how far along the fruit is. When it's not totally ripe, the birds don't tend to eat it, but they continue to come back and check it every week to make sure that they're the first ones there when it's ripe enough to feed upon. So you see the cedar waxwing in the upper right, and then you see the robins uh, taking advantage of that shrub that's got a lot of berries on it. And by the time they're done at the end of the day, they won't have anything on it. So it's a good plant to plant in your yard. And now they have cultivars such that they can produce fruit without having you know male and female but it's a great little shrub and i highly recommend it because a lot of birds will use it the eastern red cedar uh, this is one that will have they're called soft combs and i've just zoomed in on one of them uh, when you try to open it not only it smells good of course but um, it's got a, it's got sort of a pit inside of there, so there's not a lot of flesh to it. But the mockingbirds just absolutely love these berries. So if you go to plant red cedar, you need to get more than one because not all of them will have the berries. It's a male female thing on that as well. And then let's not discount the, the really usefulness of the poison ivy berries. Um, we are the only species that are bothered by poison ivy as far as getting a, a dermatitis from it, our rashes and such. They are really a great protein uh, food source, especially for our woodpeckers in the winter. And you can see the flicker in the upper right. You can see the flickers and the pileated woodpeckers. All of those vines are coming out horizontally from the tree trunk on the right, but they will sit there and pick off every little berry till they remove them all. There's our red bellied on the, on the lower left feeding on them. And believe it or not, the, the um, leaves of the poison ivy is the food plant, one of the food plants for the dreamy dusky wing caterpillar, which is there in the middle. Leave dead trees standing for cavity nesters such as owls, woodpeckers, swallows, and other birds. Don't forget the bats, overwintering butterflies, snakes, tree frogs, bluebirds, insects and flying squirrels. So going across, we have our great horned owl that nested in this uh, broken off dead tree, uh, yellow belly sapsucker on the upper right, our chickadee in the middle on the right, our flying squirrel, lower right, our flicker 
in the center, lower center, and then our pileated woodpecker working on a nest hole. Again, all of these, these cavities are huge. We tend to remove our dead trees because we think they're unsightly or whatever. But if you've got property where a dead tree isn't going to fall on something important, please consider leaving it. Um, there's our little a gray tree frog that's you that uses those cavities. They actually can overwinter in those cavities. There's our eastern screech owl in the middle. The morning cloak butterfly is part of a group of butterflies that overwinter as adults. They can go into those cavities. They can go into the exfoliating bark, say, for example, of a tree that's dying, but the bark hasn't all fallen off yet. Um, the lower and then they can come out on warm days in January or February or in March, but only to go back in again until it's time for them to come out and find a mate and mate and do the rest of their their thing to conserve their species. The middle lower section shows a little brown snake that will climb in and amongst those open like flappy pieces of bark because it's a good way to hide. That's a very small snake that doesn't really do anything to anybody, but they're an, they're an easy prey item for a bird if it finds it. And there's our eastern bluebird on the right with the young one uh, in the cavity where the arrow is pointing. So again, trees, dead trees, broken off limbs off of trees, those trees are extremely, extremely important. So let's help them to adapt and adopt. Here, this is a birdhouse that I had have in my yard. And if you take a closer look, you can see that the gray tree frog, I'm gonna go back to show it to you again, but the gray tree frog is in this little opening right here. Um, it would come out from that little cavity and it would, and it would hop over to an area where there was a light on for the time that I would take a take a dog out and would catch the bugs by the light. I would turn the light back off and in the morning I would see the little face in that opening. And of course he's smiling because he's got a place to hang out. But nest boxes can work. Um, these were some screech owls that came and they they didn't nest in these boxes but they used them as a roosting site and they spent the winter in these boxes so they can work and so if you've got the right habitat and you've got the area that might work and you don't have a ton of squirrels you might get lucky and get uh, get a little screech to come in so some of the things that I'm recommending here I'm saying let's do it for them so these are the caterpillars of the pipe vine swallowtail Here's our little baby screech owl from that pair I showed you earlier that was both the red and the gray were in the nest cavity together. Um, here's our spiderlets, our little spiderlings that are hatching out of a, uh, a nest, a spider nest basically. And then here is our Jefferson salamander larva still in the egg in one of the vernal pools that I was investigating and, and uh, doing some survey work on so you can see the edge uh, the outline of the egg around it you can see the gills on the side of the head for this for the salamander here is an american ruby spot uh, nymph in the water which is one of our damselflies and then of course our little face of our eastern bluebird it's a, a couple of days old it's starting to get some feather fuzz on it but you can see the little heart in the open mouth that's sort of the target where mom or dad is supposed to put the food so that uh, they can enjoy it and again let's do it especially for them we need our next generation to have some of the things that we grew up with but of course we know that we're not only losing habitat but a lot of kids don't spend much time outside so um, the i wanted to talk about the little girl in the upper right. She had come on a field trip and she was, I don't know how old she was, five years old, maybe six years old. And she had never blown the seed head of a dandelion before. And I just, just thought that that was really sad because that was just something that probably every kid 
I felt that every kid probably did at some point as in being a kid. And then the picture in the lower middle was one of my favorites. Um, we're down in the Amish area doing some birding. And this boy, not very old, brought the scope out, set it all up, was was had it all, had a bead on a bird. And then of course the little sister comes in, she climbs up the fence, puts the end of the <laughs> puts the end of the scope up and the, the look on the boy's face when he went from seeing a bird, just probably seeing a black blob. So again, it would be great to continue to get kids outside, let them learn. Hopefully they can be the protectors of, you know, the next generation. But a lot of the things we do now can certainly help with that. So some things you can do, volunteer, use your talents to help a park district or a land preservation organization, or all of you I know volunteer within the, you know, the Audubon group. And it's, it's extremely important because the more that you can help teach people, the more they might be the next a group that protects something. Attend field trips, take the time to learn about the natural world so that you can better help nature in need and donate when you can. Every dollar can help to protect more land, which can protect more species. So help to save the old dead trees. Um, I love this lithograph from 1865. I, I really enjoy reading old books. And um, this one I liked in particular because it sort of showed all these little cavities that you know might be in an old tree and, and had birds and bats and things like that using it. So again, um, thank you from all of us that benefit from us doing sort of the right thing for nature. And with that said, uh, here's my contact information. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Wow, thank you so much, Judy. Um, yes, if somebody does have a question, you can either toss it in the chat and I can uh then let judy know or if you want to unmute and uh and ask a question there judy and this is nancy i just want to say thank you so much for promoting poison ivy <laughs> all the time <laughs> oh all good that's great time. yeah oh, it's when I, I find that's where i find the yellow rump warblers in the winter right. time Right. When I tell people that we're the only species that are bothered with it, they are totally shocked. They would think the deer get it or anything that rubs against it or eats it. Um, so it's, it's it's interesting what people's understanding of poison ivy is in the in the grand scheme of things. Yep. No questions. I just want to say thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for joining. Oh, I just have one quick comment. It's environment controls all biological life from plants to man. So if you mess up the environment, then you mess up the relationships because we're all in a symbiotic relationship with everything on this planet. Absolutely. And I think that's what we're seeing more and more, how things are going wrong, because they've probably had as, but just about as much as they can take as far as um, the detriments that we bring to the table of nature. And, you know, they, they try to survive and get around it. And uh, we find that some of the best survival comes from our invasive species, they're all seem to be doing quite well. And our native species are really taking a hit. So the more we can do in the, all the various areas, the better off we are all going to be because we're not going to make it if our nature doesn't make it. How true it is. Absolutely. All righty, very good. Well, again, I thank everyone for joining us this evening. And I hope you'll have a good rest of the evening, rest of the week, and look forward to spring. Um, help us out with our, our uh, couple of Earth Day events or more. Join us for the spring bird walks or more. 
Uh, so we have our, our second Saturday bird walks. We've got our Tremont bird walks. We just have a lot going on. So check out our Western Cuyahoga Audubon website. And thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening. Have a good you one. Too. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you, everyone, thank for joining. Thank Bye, you. Judy. Bye-bye.